Hey, my name's Bruce Snell. I'm with BSG International, and what I'd like to do today is talk to you about our class number 13, which we're focusing on team and individual problem solving. It's in part four, class 13. And if you look at uh, part four, this is the first class in that. This whole heading and uh, next uh, uh, classes are gonna be focused on personal preventive and corrective action. What we're saying here is that we not only want to be able to correct a particular problem or brainstorm for problems or whatever, but we also want to be able to be uh, preventive, keep those problems from happening. So these are what this workshops and this part, or these classes and this part is going to be focusing on. So if you'll look at uh, your handout and turn to page one and look at changing the perception of the problems in the workplace. Now what we're talking about there is that our people are not the problems and 98% of the uh, problems in our organization are due to the four barriers to quality. And remember that 99% of our people are good people and wanna do a good job. Encourage, don't shoot the messenger delivering the problem. See what we're talking about there is that how many times you hear, oh bring me, uh, bring me whatever's bothering you, bring me, and also here now, bring me a solution with that. Well, either way, we have a tendency to attack whoever is bringing that problem to the organization or, or to management's attention or co-worker. So what we're saying, let's encourage, let's encourage our employees to go in and find opportunities and problems that we can solve to help our organization and help our base work centers. Okay, if you look at our base values, what we're talking about there and some of the bigger companies that we got into, it's literally almost impossible to write a procedure, everything known to man, especially in re regards to values and ethics. So we've written what we call base values, and that's promoting goodness in our workplace, the quality of life. And in that, we have two rules. And these two rules are do what's morally and ethically correct and treat everybody as you want to be treated. So if we can do that, I think we can all get along uh, in the organization with also remembering that our people are good people. Now that statistic includes management. We have a tendency to be pointing fingers at management and saying they're bad folks. Management is just as, just as concerned, just as caught up in the four barriers as everybody else. And so what we're looking at is that our people are basically good people. It's the four barriers to quality that's kind of messing all this stuff up. Okay, let's look at our executive summary where we're looking at the processes defined. We have four problem-solving processes. Today, we're just going to focus on process A, the five steps. Uh, process B is the task team format, and we'll be getting into that in our next class and touching on that. Uh, process C is the directed task team, and process D is the quick action. Okay, and if you look at the process A is the five steps, this is where 98% of the problems that we're going to be addressing internally within an organization are used in this process here. If you look at step number one is brainstorming, and we're going to ask, uh, what are our problems? What are our problems in our work center and the organization that are keeping me from doing a good job? Uh, step two, uh, solution. We're saying, which problem will the team work on? And what we're saying here is that we need to look at under step two, I'm sorry, it should be selection and not solution. We're saying selecting which problem will the team work on. So number one, we'll brainstorm, we'll list them. Number two is then we'll go through and ask and select which problem will the team work on. Step three is cause and effect. And what we're doing there is asking why is the problem happening? As we go through this and start bringing up these problems, if we keep the problems and keep the people internally within the organiza organization focused in their base work center, we're not going to have a problem solving uh, any of these things here. Because remember, who's the best person to tell you how to do the job? Probably the best person to tell you how to fix that problem in their base work center is that person doing the job. Then step four is data collection and display. Uh, basically what we're doing there is that if we can't agree on the cause and effect or why, sometimes we have to collect data and we have to display it in order to make a decision based off of data. But, and, and that was one of the things that started years ago that going through all these steps and what we found was is that by just letting our people focus in on their job, we didn't need a big elaborate system in order to try to problem solve. They already knew the answer. 
So here, chances are it going to uh, step four is, I, I can't even tell you how many times in 10 years we've used it, not very much. And then step five is presentation. So if you look at step four, we collect data, we try to make an informed decision, and if that decision is out of our area of expertise and control our decision-making uh, ability, then we go for a presentation. And then that presentation is for whoever that person that has the uh, sign-off that can either give us a, a yay or a nay on that. Okay, now if you look at uh, page number four, it's the four barriers to quality effect on team members. Now, I put this together. And what we're looking at here is that as we break up in the teams and we do all this stuff, we're going to be looking at what are these things that are going to be affecting our teams and our team members. The, what we call the existing way of doing business and breaking through the four barriers to quality. I've list four things that we look at in regards to the four barriers. And uh, the existing way of doing business, number one, is uh, fearful or act fearful of action and or comments. When there's no fear, it's fearless. And look at uh, conceal, uh, self-defense of actions and comments. We become very, very closed and we become very defensive. And when there's no fear, where there's a securement, we kind of let and just focus on the problem and not caught up on how all these other things of what we might say affect me, the team, or the organization. And when there's a uh, fear of expression or action, we dread meetings. <laughs> I don't know if y'all have ever dreaded going to a meeting. And when there's no fear, we have self-confidence. Wavering, do I or don't I? When you've got that fear, I'm not sure if I'm going to uh, get involved and step up or not. And when there's no fear, we are uh, unconcerned about our action. Because remember, really, all we're trying to do is do what's right. And that's why we're saying fear is so paralyzing to an or organization. And if you look at number two is the lack of communication, verbal and or written, is the existing way. Breaking through the four barriers is open, uh, open communication. With lack of uh, uh, communication, verbal or written, we're withholding our thoughts. And basically, with open communication, we have full disclosure. So number three is lack of written procedure. And what we're talking about there, writ lack of written procedure, we're calling it Im implied or informal. And we talked about that in a, a lot of other classes. And when it's implied, there's confusion, disorder, hit and miss, redo of work and effort. And when there's written pr procedure, we clarify our systems, or organize of the base work center, direct efforts, processes are defined. Number four is lack of training. When we have lack of training, it, our workers are uninformed, unknowing, unreasoned, and we just don't know how to get there. And with formal training, there's an awareness and an understanding of how the four barriers to quality not only affect us, but affect our team. So it's very important as we get into this problem solving stuff that we remember how these four barriers are interacting with everything that we're doing from not only trying to brainstorm but sit down and function as a team, but as we go in and start defining uh, the organization. Uh, so that's our, uh, uh, how the four barriers to quality affect. Now if you look on page number five, page number five is talking about process A, and we're going to look at step number one. Step one is brainstorming for matters of direct interest or importance to oneself or team. The purpose Brainstorm is a way to achieve a response for ideas, decisions, solutions, problems of the team and our organization interests. So what we're saying there is that we want to look at in step one, brainstorm not only for problems, but for idea solutions. So this technique can be used in a lot of different ways other than just brainstorming for problems. Okay, if we look at now the procedure rules for brainstorming. Okay, is that number one, is one idea per person in a rotation around the room. So what we're saying here is that as we start, we're going to start, start at one end of the table and work our way around. And we're saying there's only one idea per person in rotation. 
What we're trying to do when we start brainstorming, uh, it has to be kind of in an orderly fashion because if you look at it, the teams have a tendency to run off in, in a lot of different directions and conversation starts. A lot of conversations, which we'll get into here, will start trying to defend or justify or define that particular uh, problem that we're brainstorming. So right here we're saying the rules apply for the brainstorming is that we're going to rotate around a room, we're going to go around and ask each individual. Everyone is encouraged to contribute ideas. So what we're trying to do there as the organization grows and as, as their sphere is, is that sometimes it's hard to get people internally within the organization to contribute, especially if we have some shutdown employees that are just kind of setting back and not really paying any, any attention one way or the other, they're just kind of sitting through it because the last time they got involved, they got shut down or they end up doing a bunch of work uh, for nothing. So this is a, uh, an easy way to get people to contribute. And we don't want it to turn into a gripe session uh, or negative. We don't want to sit there and start talking about people or the company or customers or nothing. We want, really want to focus on in our area that inter interest us and that are problems for us. Uh, everybody, uh, individuals may piggyback on, build on, or expand on someone else's ideas. And what we're saying there is somebody brings up an idea and it kind of makes you think of something, you can build on that or add on uh, to that particular uh, brainstorm uh, uh, problem. Uh, next is the procedure, uh, under the procedures for brainstorming, all ideas are recorded on a flip chart as they, are as they are voiced with initials of who said that. That idea for uh, possible assist assistance when the problems are clarified. When we go and start brainstorming, most of our teams have flip charts. And in that, we just start writing on there uh, the brainstorm problems. And then we put the initials because Especially if you brainstorm, I actually had a company uh, one time, which is really kind of neat. Uh, they brainstormed 146 uh, problems. And if you're just getting started in your company with brainstorming, you'll see that there will be a lot of stuff like with preventive maintenance or things that we haven't done for a while will be some of those issues. So if, if we come around your room and if, if you don't have an idea, just say pass. Now, when, when it comes around, you can get back in on the next round, but if we're working our way around a room and they come to you and you go pass, then we just go to the next person. Also, we got to hold our comments for when we're, uh, when we're brainstorming, is that we're not going to defend it or clarify it or do anything. Okay, next is number six. If you say pass on the one round of brainstorming, you can get back in during the next round of ideas. That's kind of what I just said, is that if you look at it, if you pass, go back around, you can get back in. That doesn't mean that you're disqualified for the whole thing. Brainstorming continues until all individuals say pass on the same round. So if you look at it, what we've been doing here is that we're kind of going around the room, we're brainstorming, for right now, problems. We're asking everyone there to put up uh, their, their idea or the thing that affects them and now we're going back around and getting everybody's input. We're not clarifying, we're not doing anything other than just stating the problem and putting the folks' initials by. So if you look at next, the procedure, the rules for brainstorming. There is no clarification or ex explanation of ideas until the brainstorming has concluded. This is kind of what we've said, is that you, what you don't want to do is that somebody throws up an idea and everybody starts jumping in there and everybody starts trying to either defend it, justify it, clarify it, or ask what you mean. Because what you'll see is that the whole mood of the meeting will change. And so what we're, we're suggesting is, is that hold all those comments and if you've got a comment, just kind of write it down personally or something. But hold that comment, there'll be a time for us to clarify and stuff a little later on. So it's very important that we let the team brainstorm and get all the input and list it. So we're, we don't want to clarify it or defend it or, or do anything because it really does kind of just uh, take the steam out of there. And it says wild and crazy ideas are to encourage to stimulate creativity and have fun. 
So what we're saying is, is don't let this thing get so serious that we're all locked up and we can't have a good time. Uh, just, just have fun with it. And remember, just don't take this stuff uh, that serious here, meaning that uh, we're all locked in and we're, we're going in with this attitude that we're just going to uh, get somebody else or we're going to get another uh, department or we're going to uh, try to uh, brainstorm and solve all the company's issues. Really, all we're trying to do is, at this point is throw some problems up that affect us in our base work center. If you look at now on page six, if you look at on page six, the, uh, we're at uh, selection. Step two is selection. Which response will the team work on? Okay, step two, the selection is, is the purpose is to prioritize the response selected to, to the one response that concerns most of the members. Now, how do we do that? We multi-vote. The technique provides an orderly way to reduce the long list of responses down to a short list, which can be more easily analyzed. So really, all we're doing is that we're going through, we've listed all the problems up there, and now we're going through and multi-vote, meaning which is the, the issue or the problem or the solution or whatever that most affects that team that the team wants to vote on. Because remember, we got to move from an individual effort in a team to get everybody involved and get everybody's uh, input. And rules uh, is that everyone participates, no criticism, no comments, people can pass, discussion is carried on in a round robin order. Put the initials of team members involved in brainstorming beside each problem solution. And if you look at this, the, the, the rules of what we're talking about is that as we go through, everybody participates. There's no criticism. We're not looking at being negative or making fun of someone because all that's going to do is just shut the whole team down. And there's uh, uh, no comments, don't voice opinions, or what you're going to do is that you'll sometimes get a lot of negative rap and that'll get everybody kind of moving the whole thing off again. And remember that the, the people can, can pass. And the multi-voting is that the procedure for the multi-voting is review the list of brainstorm names and see if there's any names used th that need to be cut or have been listed twice or we combined because they're saying the same thing. So if we're up there and we're multi-voting and we're looking at and we've selected, we now want to start and clarify uh, basically if we have some that have the same uh, I guess kind of the same thing but uh, reworded or said a, a little different way. So as we're going around, we're uh, going to assume that we have 20 brainstorm names and we usually go through three rounds. And what we try to do is that there's one vote per example. If we have uh, 20 brainstorms names, we can have 20 different votes. And what we're trying to do is just vote on the ones that you want to or you feel that is important to you or to the team. And the reason we give each individual uh, 20 votes, if we have 20 as an example, is, is that what we're, what we're saying there, we don't want to just go in and cut the list in half. We want to gradually bring it down uh, to an, a consensus agreement through this multi-voting. Then round two is, is that let's just say that we cut the thing by 20%. Our goal here in this round two is to cut it by 50%. So what we'll do is that we'll take half of those votes and then now we go through to round three. Time we multi-vote it down and we get down to uh, one vote for that round three. So literally what we've done is that we could vote on every one of them and that usually in our goal is try to reduce it by 20%. Then it narrowly brings it down. Then we've got another vote where we vote half, which will reduce it by another 50%. Then we get down and just have one vote, and then that's how we uh, select uh, which problem that the team will work on. Okay, if you look at now step two, step 2A is on page 7. And if you look at step 2A, consensus selection, agree to a response. Now the reason we've got this uh, consensus selection 
as we go through this, you're going to see brainstorming for problems and multi-voting are one thing. But when we start trying to agree on procedure, process, step, it's not necessarily a multi-vote that this is the right one or this one. It's going to make and take the team and the team members to come to a consensus agreement. So this is what we're saying here, step 2A, depending on where we're at in the process or what we're doing. Multi-voting is fine to select a problem to work on, but it's also, too, if we're trying to agree on a procedure, we might have to use step uh, 2A, which is really kind of negotiating and coming to an agreement on that particular issue. Purpose, when multi-voting is not appropriate selection of agreement, the team uses consensus selection. This step is used when coming to an agreement to a response when dealing with process, step, procedures, and systems. Now, our goals of this is the goal is to move the team to an agreement of a response uh, that the team will direct and focus on a number lim limit of objects. And what we're saying there is that instead of getting it way out here, we're trying to work it down. Now, if it's trying to come to an agreement of procedure, what we want to do is, again, try to negotiate it, come to a consensus agreement, and the team makes the decision as an example on that procedure or that process or step. Next is the five phases of uh, consensus agreement of the team members. If you look at this, once a response is selected, the five phases, five uh, is basically our decision, analyze, uh, I'm sorry, discussion, analyze, decision, agreement, and implementation. So these are the five phases that the team is going to be working through. That is, we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about whatever the problem or whatever the situation or whatever the deal's on the table, and then two, we're going to analyze it. We're going to step back and look at that thing. Three is, is that we're going to have to make a decision. And remember, we want to make decisions based on data, and number four is agreement, meaning that we come to an agreement on it. And then number five is implementation. Uh, team members' personal goals. The team members must be aware of personal things to remember while participating in all team discussions. While team members are interacting with each other, uh, we must consistently reinforce things to remember, not only with ourselves, but to, do, uh, but to others as well. So not only is it something that we need to po uh, positively focus on and reinforce, but we also need to make sure that we're helping out our team members and respecting them. The team barriers to uh, quality agreement. The things to be aware of in regards to quality agreement must have to do with personal issues that in fact become subconscious habits. We're saying look at and make sure that we're not kind of throwing things out there and that we're dealing with some interpersonal issues other than dealing with the real issue, which the issue is on the table. And that is, that subconscious habit is, is that basically we've had an argument with that department, so subconsciously I'm kind of sabotaging the deal. What we're saying is, let's put our emotion aside and let's just focus, really, on what the issue is and the issue on the table. Now, if you look at how the four barriers affect team members. This is what we talked about, the existing way of doing business and breaking through the four barriers to quality. Okay, the five phases of consensus agreement on number eight. Okay, the five phases is, is that we want to look at this. It says the team phases. This is kind of what the team's going to be going through, what we discussed a second ago. Then we want to look at the team member's personal goals. These are the things as a team member we need to be looking at personally. And then we have the team barriers to quality agreement, things to be aware of. So if you look at as, we as the discussion goes on, we're finding out, we're realizing, and we're becoming aware of that particular problem or issue that we're dealing with. From a team member, things to remember, we need to remember the base values, modesty, and humble. Humble ourselves to where our egos are not involved in it and things to be aware of. Disrespect, ego, and arrogance. Number two is analyze. And analyze is discuss, explain, reason. Thing to remember is respect, assist, and encourage. Our, not only myself, but our team members. Things to be aware of. Impoliteness, rudeness, unmannerly. So when we're dealing with this five phases in a team environment, 
We really need to be conscious of all these things. Number three is dis, uh, decision, judgment, the finding out the outcome. So as we're going through this, we're going to go through a discussion, analyze, and starting to make some decisions. And hopefully, the judgment the, uh, part uh, will be coming to a rational decision based off of data and not emotion. Things to remember is honesty, openness, and uh, trust, uh, truthfulness. Things to be aware of, procrastinating, hiding, lying, and half-truths. Okay, number four is agreement. The agreement must be made by the people that are involved in the process, and the outcome is usually a written procedure. If you look at number four, talking about the agreement, We've stressed throughout this whole uh, certification uh, program here is that it, we're looking at it, all the decision, all the involvement needs to be done by those people that are involved in that particular process and that particular process having to deal with that base work center. So we, we're saying we come to an agreement by the people that are involved in it and then that is usually a written procedure. Most of the time the written procedure uh, is best defined by that person doing that job. And it might be the written procedure. We might have several different people in that, uh, uh, in that problem solving team or in that department writing bits and pieces of it depending on how their expertise is. Number five is the implementation. The employee must be trained on the procedure before the agreement or solution is fully implemented. That's one of the uh, uh, things that we also discovered is that if we usually go through and write a procedure or do something, or example here, we come to an agreement, have a written procedure, we, we halfway implement it, meaning we either pass out memos or we kind of tell everybody, or we don't communicate it with the uh, employees or the company. We're saying that there's an implementation process that we need to go through, and we can't hold anybody accountable with that until uh, we have them trained on it. So that's the implementation part, and it's, it's really one of the more important things. If you look at now on page 10, on process A, it says uh, 3A, how to ask why. And that's the cause and the effect. The purpose is to get the team members to move co to a consensus agreement to an agreement or consensus agreement, such as asking why is the problem happening. Now this example here is says, example problem, shipping is getting sloppy paperwork. Now that's kind of a big, big uh, question or brainstorm problem. We're saying here, let's look at, ask why is that? Because no one cares. Then we're saying, well, why is that? Because they have not been held accountable. And then why is that? There is no written procedure. What we're trying to say here is that by asking why, keep going through it. And the majority of the time, you're going to find the reason that it's a problem, there's no written procedure on it. And this kind of goes back to everything that we've been talking about. Okay, so we have basically have asked why. Our next step is, is that what we want to do is come to an agreement that we can all come to. And the next step is spin out of a task team. If we can come to an agreement on the solution, then the team members, we don't need to go any further in the uh, five-step process. We can literally now spin out to a task team. A good question to ask, is the problem because of the four barriers to quality, fear of expression, action, lack of communication, verbal, written, and lack of written procedure? So in that, our, really our first question should be is, number one, is it a written procedure? And if it's not a written procedure, as we're starting to ask why, what's that tell us? That's probably the first place we need to go to look at this thing, okay? So now if you look at uh, page number 11, okay, page number 11 is how to uh, make a good problem statement. What I'm going to do is just kind of uh, go back a little bit, and we're going to stay here of how we got to this problem statement. Number one, we brainstorm for problems. We literally ask, what are the problems in our area of expertise and control in our job that are affecting us? And we went around the room and brainstorm. And remember, we basically did that until everybody passed on the, sa on the same, uh, all on the same round. Number two was, is that we now brainstorm, now we're going to select which problem will the team work on? So how do we do that? 
uh, when we're selecting problems, the easiest way to do that is through multi-voting because we're really kind of trying to get it down to what the team's going to work on. So what we'll do is that we will, uh, in order to make a selection in step two, we will multi-vote. Now step outside of that in step 2A, consensus agreement. When we're dealing with procedure and dealing with process, we're probably not able to multi-vote saying, here's one procedure, choose which one. What we're saying is that it's usually going to be a combination of both of them. And that's where we're saying a consensus agreement. So it's a literally of what we usually do is uh, we get the people in their area of expertise to kind of draft it up, write it. And then what we do is bring it and then we come to an agreement. It's a lot easier to fix something or tear something up once it's defined. So now let's look at, let's go back, we brainstorm, we've selected a problem. Now number three is why is the problem happening? So we're looking at what are our problems, which problem we work on, and why is that problem happening? Then we ask basically the three whys, and that will usually give us the answer. Once we go until we can't go any further and say, it, because our, it's not a written procedure for this particular uh, example. So now we're looking at, we agree on the, uh, the cause. So now what we do is that we spin out to a, a task team. But first, what, before that task team, we write a good problem statement. Now the reason we don't write a problem statement in, in the process earlier is that, because I kind of learned that from uh, mistakes years ago, like cut and combine and clarify. We would go through and brainstorm, and then before we got through brainstorm, we'd start trying to clarify them. Well, we ended up going like a couple of months and never really got to any problems. We were just clarifying and, uh, and defining those things. So what we're saying here is, is that now after you selected the problem that you're going to work on, make a good problem statement. Usually by making a good problem statement will suggest a possible solution. So is it important to spend the time writing a good problem statement? Yes, it is, because the problem statement needs to be, number one, narrowly enough that the team can address it. Because if it's too wide, too big, too vague, uh, we'll spend our whole lifetime in the company trying to fix it and can't do anything. So let's look down. This is just gives you some examples, and you can kind of review that. But it says, state the problem narrowly enough so that the team can handle it. And that was original. Shipping is getting all kinds of sloppy paperwork. Improved. Shipping is receiving incorrectly prepared bills of lading. Next is write the problem as a de de declarative statement, not as a question. Original. Why can't the right paperwork get to the shipping department on time? I think we've all kind of gone through that one. People are sending the bills of lading to the shipping department late delaying deliveries. Be detailed rather than general. And man, what we're saying there uh, is other than this general wide sweeping statement, the shipping department is getting wrong uh, color copies of paperwork. Shipping is receiving yellow copies of the bills of lading when it should be getting the blue copies. Next is avoid mentioning blame, causes, or solution. That's one of the things, especially when the four barriers are in, we have a tendency to start attacking, start pointing fingers, and start defending, and start justifying. So what we're saying is we don't need to do any of that, blame cause, or try to give solutions. That's not what we're doing. All we're trying to do is write a good problem statement. Use measurable quantities when possible, and this is really uh, uh, important here too. Original, shipping is getting too much incorrect paperwork. Improved, in the past month, the shipping department received 22 incorrectly submitted bills of lading. Personally, I think the 22 is pretty good. <laughs> if we look at that, the solution is written procedure for bills of lading. Remember, out of all the stuff that we talked about when we're brainstorming, you remember we've talked and talked about uh, informal system or processes. Before we can ever start brainstorming, um, I'm sorry, before we can ever stop uh, or ever start fixing a problem, we really need to step back and look at that thing and ask, is there a written procedure? And is that system or is that problem defined? Because if it's not, that's going to tell us exactly what we've got to do internally within the organization and internally within that team to fix it. 
So a problem statement is really uh, very key and very important uh, in this process. All right, now let's look at page number 12. Page number 12 is um, kind of a little worksheet we worked up here to kind of uh, kind of help you out. Now this is one that you can literally take uh, to your teams or to the meetings or just as yourself to kind of help uh, uh, work through everything that we just talked about. We put all those five steps right here on this one form and it says uh, brainstorming for problem solution worksheet. The five steps for problem solving. Number one, what are our problems? And we're saying here, just list them. Now we can do this as individuals, we can do it as departments, by base work centers, or as a team. But this is a good little worksheet for us to do. So what we're asking you here is just list what those problems are. Number two, which problem will, the, will we work on? Okay, what we're talking about there is the selection process. We'll multi-vote to select the problem. We'll reach a consensus agreement of the problem and our solution. We can use the same format of not only brainstorming for problems, but also for a uh, solution. And then after we reach a consensus agreement of the problem solution, basically saying it's either a deal or this is the one that we're going to take, we want to write a problem statement. And remember, the problem statement, as we just covered a second ago, is so important. We really have to do a good job on writing that problem statement. And sometimes it might get a little aggravating because it would seem like you're spending a lot of time, but in, in fact you're not uh, because you'll end up. And we've done this before, early on years ago, that we get in and we have this big problem what you'll see is, is that as the team goes, we'll start tearing that big problem apart. And what, what, what'll happen is we've actually had it sometimes with one that we brainstormed before we kind of figured this out, is that we ended up with that one problem creating 10 other problems that really moved the whole team off of, off of its focus. So we really need to narrow it down and write a good problem statement. Then it says, why is the problem happening? Uh, please list. Is there a written procedure? Remember, that's one of the first things we want you to ask. Is there a written procedure? Because if there's not a written procedure, what does it tell you? We've got to write a procedure. Brainstorm problem solution list. We're going, okay, why is the problem happening? What we'll say is that we'll, even if we have to put it up on the flip chart, what is the problem or what are the solutions? And the consensus agreement on the solution and the problems. What we're saying and looking at is that as we're multi-voting or making a consensus agreement on why is the problem happening, as you will see the written procedure, we could literally have on the flip chart a bunch of uh, brainstorm solutions, let's say. We've discovered that the majority of the solutions that we're going to be brainstorming is literally going to be uh, put into a procedure. And there will be different steps or different pieces of that procedure or of that process and step. So as we go through, again, you will see a lot, of, if you brainstorm more than one or two or something like that, what you're going to do is that a lot of those uh, solutions are the things that we brainstorm will be involved in one procedure. Uh, data collection and display uh, to support the solution. What data needs to be collected and for how long? Now remember what we talked about is that the, I think in all my many years we've only gone to step four or five maybe just a couple of times and it says data collection and display. Okay, we're saying we can agree on what, this, uh, what the, the solution is or why the problem's happening. So what we're doing here is having to get and collect data to support that. Example, somebody says, uh, well, the reason we're coming up short because we're not getting, uh, we're not checking off inventory. And so the solution is some, then someone else is saying someone is stealing. So maybe we'll have to run a trial test, check in the inventory and see if that improves and or watch and see if, and uh, basically audit the inventory and see if somebody is stealing. So that's what we're saying to collecting data to, uh, to basically uh, to give us a, uh, uh, kind of make us, give us data to make a decision. Now again, even under that scenario, 
if you don't have written procedure for either one of those, we've got to write some procedure and define that process and step before we ever get into anything else because that's usually the, the answer to the problems. Okay, and then if we're going to collect data to support, how long do we need to collect it? We're always going to say, try to collect that thing that best represents a full cycle. You don't want to get it at the end that doesn't really hold true to uh, what a current, our current run is that's pretty consistent. We want to try to get something that reflects how we're doing business. The presentation, the data to support decision, what we're saying there is that as we collect the data to support that decision, because when we get in front is that number one, if it's going for a, uh, a decision, meaning it's outside of the team's area of expertise and control. So we brainstorm a solution, and maybe even the solution was outside our budget, let's say. So we're going to have to collect the data to support that. And what we what we all know is that we can't make a decision without data. So that decision maker needs to have that data collected to where they can make an informed decision. So if you look at this, we're going, okay, what is the things that we need? And that's where it says who presents the data. We're going to go, okay, for the team, who's going to represent the team and give the presentation? What data is needed? Probably how much it's going to cost, how long, or how it's going to affect, uh, and how it's shaped up with all the other stuff. And who do we present the data to? This is where we're saying all the base work centers that are involved look at the person that can sign off on that particular deal. So that's really who we're going to be making uh, that presentation to. Then, at basically in step five, we're either going to get a, a go or a no-go, and so what's going to happen is, is that then we'll just get back in and go in and start solving the problem then. Okay, let's look down at the bottom of page 12. That's action items, quick action, and these are some forms that you will probably have to use, and we'll cover some of those in a second uh, to, as we look at the solving the problems, that is process and steps, procedure, training and implementation, then the base work systems 2000 kit. And we'll look at that in just a second. And you're going to probably be seeing that kit in the majority of our classes from here on out as we get into this thing and uh, start looking at uh, solving these problems. Because these are the forms that we, uh, that we use. If you look at page number 13, uh, page number 13 is the action item, and that's where we have, if you look up at the top, the Base Work Systems 2000 kit. And it says here the listing of all of the forms that we're going to be needing for this particular class. So if you look at these items going down, we're looking at, uh, we're going to have a problem statement, action item, quick action, and I'm going to uh, go through those right now. If you look at page 14, Page 14 is the problem statement form. This is a blank form. Uh, if you all remember, we talked about that earlier, about writing a good problem statement. So this is the form that we would write the problem statement on. So again, if you look at it, we're, we have brainstormed the problem, we've multi-voted, we've selected it, and now we're saying that we probably know the reason and we have, are now spinning out. And so we got to write a problem statement. We've selected it. Now we have to write a very good problem statement. Uh, uh, page number 15 is the action item quick action. As your teams get together, what we're going to ask you to do is that when you're in the meetings, have this action item form. If you're asking somebody to do something, we need to log it. Example, it says uh, action item number one. We just go, okay, uh, We've asked Brian to bring a, a, a new stand or something to, to class or to our next meeting. And what we're looking at is that we just describe what it is, who accepted it, Brian, the date accepted, today's date, target date. What we try to do is with the target dates, we try to get that at our next scheduled meeting. What we're going to try to do is schedule these meetings out. So the action item form, if you look up at the top, it has the problem statements. So all we do is write down what that problem statement is up at the top and then we're going to basically hold everyone accountable for these action items. So when we're in a team, we're going to take these, 
and we're going to write them down and we're going to hold them accountable. Now, especially early on in the program, this is a, it's really kind of tough because a lot of folks have not been held accountable. So you'll see people getting involved or volunteering and they won't get to work, but what the work done when they said they're going to. But what you're going to see is that that's going to change as we start changing habit uh, in the organization. So the action item is a, a real important piece uh, that we can basically take that and hold and manage and hold everyone accountable. If you look at page 16, page 16 is the uh, process and steps form. Now remember, what we're saying is, is that as we brainstorm that problem, we need to look at is there a system in place, is there a process and steps. Now if, if you remember, we've talked about the process and steps is merely just like uh, flow charting or process mapping. So all we're going to do is that for whatever particular problem that we brainstorm, we're going to look at the process and steps of that, uh, that solution, of that system, of that process. Okay, if you look at page 16 and page 17, that's basically the front and back of that uh, uh, process and steps form. Now let's go to page 18. Page 18 is the Base Work Center Procedures thought process. And the reason that we work this up is, is that what we, we kind of experienced is as we went through these uh, brainstorming and these team uh, problem solving things, we'd get in and we'd start writing procedure. And then when we'd bring the stuff back, somebody goes, well, what about this? What about this? You go, ah, oh, I forgot about that. So this is what we kind of did was make a little checklist on this sheet here of a thought process to make sure that we're including everything on, uh, on that procedure that is involved in it. And if you look at, again, on this, we want to make sure we list all the base work centers that are involved in it. Then we want to review the form summary. What we're saying here is uh, let's collect all the forms or all the paperwork or data screen entries that are involved in that uh, problem statement or that solution. Because remember, we keep saying that the paper process is going to suggest a system that's going to kind of suggest a base work center. Then, if nothing else, we have that defining base work center worksheet. We're asking you just kind of to list those things that you see, whether it's on the flip chart or on a list, of that, the things that are involved in that process. And here are some of the questions down below. Is there a written procedure? Remember, that's our first question. Is there a written procedure? If not, we've got to write one. We're going to ask what is done, when is it done, under what circumstances, who does it, where is it done, with what resources, the four M's, where are those resources kept, why is it done, how will the procedure be managed, planned, scheduled, and monitored, and then how is the data entered, collected, and reported. And then we're going to have... Uh, Procedure solution, which is name the procedure and or the solution. Then at the bottom we have a, the date of the implementation. So as we go through this thing, we write a problem statement. We want to define that process and step of that, that system. And then we want to make sure with the procedure that we are not only writing the procedure, but involving everything that as from that checklist to make sure we're writing a good procedure. So then we've now looked at, we've written a problem statement. We now looked at basically the process and steps. Now we're kind of thinking through procedure. And form number 19 is the Base Work Center Procedures form. Okay, now this is the form that we're going to write the actual procedures. And if you look at our process and steps uh, form, you'll, have, you'll see on there, it'll say reference and step, uh, reference steps. This is what we're talking about here, is that you might have in your process and steps, the form we just went over, it might have 20 steps. Well, there could literally be a procedure page for each one of those steps. So this is what we write to procedure. And the reason we write to procedure uh, on this form is that number one, where all the forms and all the procedures and everything that we're doing has kind of a, a common direction. Also, it's again going to list all the base work centers. And then all we do is just uh, literally go through and start writing uh, the procedure for whatever that particular issue is. And page 20 
uh, is the, the second page of, of that procedure form. So now let's look at page number 21. Page number 21 is the training and implementation. Now I'm going to go over this again. If you remember, we talked about if we do get it to where we're finally uh, have, number one, did and uh, executed a uh, problem into a solution, where we fail a lot of times is the formal implementation. Remember we talked earlier, we kind of run around and say, okay, here's this, we're going to be doing this for a day or two or something like that. But what we need to do here is make sure we formalize that process. And that's what we do with this training and implementation. If you look at this training and implementation form, it's going to say who will train the results of the team, the task team. If you look at this, we're saying here that uh, we're going to list who's going to train the location and the date and the time. Now, who is the best person probably to train on that particular uh, process or that particular procedure? Probably the guy that's already doing it, probably the person that's on that team. So it doesn't really like go back to like management does it. Everybody in the organization uh, is involved in that. Next it says base work centers will be, uh, th that will be trained or affected. So we're asking here, affected by that particular procedure or that process or that brainstorm problem. So what we'll do is just list them there. And then what will we use to train? Most of the time our training is going to be on the written procedure and the process that we put together in this team. So it, again, if you look at this, we're going to say probably, and how we usually do it on that flip chart, we just write that procedure out pretty big and then that becomes the thing that we train on. Uh, and then, may, then the other thing we want to walk on through and we want to make sure are there handouts. Yeah, what are the handouts are probably going to be the written procedure uh, and the process and step if there is one. So we want to make sure we have plenty of copies for everybody and sign off. And we want to make sure that the reason we keep listing all the base work centers is to make sure that everybody that touches or is involved in that process receives training. And this will help us with the uh, accountability and stuff. So that's our training and implementation uh, form there. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of recap and then we're going to get into our, uh, our questions here. If you look at, again, what is it that we're talking about in this, this uh, problem solving? This process here, this class is used, class 13 is, is used for as an individual or as a team. If there is a particular problem that we're addressing, we will have a formal process to address that. And how do we address it? We use basically, which is process A, the five step, which we only use three steps of those, and that is in a short, why, which problem we work on, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what are our problems, uh, which problem we work on, and why is that happening? And then once we agree on it, then we go through and move that thing uh, through uh, to a written procedure. If you look at, uh, number one, frequently asked questions and our thoughts, how can I take back and apply this workshop? If you look at this, all of these classes are all basically self-sufficient, so you should be able to take this back and take this whole class with you and basically train the folks that are going to be in your, uh, if you want to start brainstorming, and they'll be able to take it back and use these forms to help you organize your thoughts and use the procedures to basically kind of give the direction for the team. And then it says, what do you mean don't shoot the messenger but encourage? Remember, most of the time we just beat the tar out of the person that's bringing us a particular problem or whatever it is. And we're saying we really have to step back from it and get under control and not beat that person up. We're saying other than uh, beating up the messenger or shooting the messenger, we're saying encourage them. And when they bring you the problem, don't beat them up. Step back, take a couple of deep breaths because Remember, we've been confronted daily with all these problems and sometimes we get a little short-tempered or short with people, then all of a sudden they're just going to stop bringing us stuff. Uh, number three, is the problem because of the four barriers to quality? 
if you look at it, chances are 98% of the time they're having to do with the four barriers to quality. And if you remember, the, the four barriers to quality are fear of expression, lack of communication, lack of written procedure, and lack of training. This is everything that we talked about uh, here. So how does giving us a starting point by reviewing the four barriers to quality, how does this give us a starting point by reviewing the four barriers to quality? Because by reviewing the four barriers to quality, depending on the answer, that's going to tell you basically what we have to do. Number one, is it because of fear? But I guarantee you, you get in there, there's probably not going to be a written procedure. And if you look at that, if the written procedure is not defined, uh, then that's our solution to the thing. So if you look at it, 98% of the times, by going through and going through those four barriers to quality, that's going to tell us what we have to do and where that problem is. I think we have more than 1% that are bad employees. Uh, almost every company I go to, they're going, hey, Bruce, you messed up, said uh, you're saying 99% are good people. Our company's unique. We have 99% that are the 1%. Now, in most organizations, the numbers hold true, and they hold true that 1% affect 5% with the same negative characteristics that in turn affect 20% of the, the workforce with those, maybe one of those five or six negative characteristics. So if you look at it, your 1% statistically over these last 10 or 11 years have always kind of shook out to that 1%. And remember, up front, We've never had to fire anybody. Those folks would just leave. As the organization started formalizing, what happened was their co-workers started holding them accountable because they've been aggravating their co-workers uh, for all these years. We, we only use three of the five steps most of the time. Okay, the reason we're talking about process A, we're saying the majority of the time we only use the first three, and that is what are our problems, which problem we work on, and why is that problem happening, which we kind of refer to also as the three W's. And I think I've done, I've only used the other ones, I can't even remember, that's how few we did it. So most of the time we'll just use the three of the five steps. Do the four barriers to quality affect team members? Yes, they do. Because if you look at it, the four barriers to quality, if they're there, is more than likely going to shut down not only the organization, but it's going to shut down the team stuff. So if you look at that, always be aware of how these four barriers to quality are interacting, not only with the organization, but with your uh, team members. What is the difference between multi-voting and consensus agreement? Multi-voting is we're just basically going through and selecting, multi-voting through to a, uh, one particular item. Consensus agreement is putting a bunch of them together, or one, and coming to a consensus agreement on it. Who is the best person and our base work center involved in solving the problem? The base work center, the best one, is the person that is in that particular problem in that base work center. Why are the base skills so important? Look at everything we've been talking about in all these classes. Everything goes from one thing to the next in the base skills. Can we apply these base skills at home? We've just learned and talked about how to problem solve. What do you mean by base skills are transferable? You can use these skills at work or at home from one department, one division, Everywhere in the organization you go, these skills will go with you. So that's, that's kind of ending it up here today for class number 13 and on problem solving. So think of how you can use it individually and your teams. Uh, thank you and have a good day.